now we're moving on from Greece to Rome, which is similar to Rome in certain ways. Like visually, it's very similar because why? Who knows why it's similar to Greece visually? Yeah, then I meant architecturally. We talk about classical architecture. What are we talking about? Greek and Roman stuff. And columns, marble, naked people and statues, stuff like that, right? So the reason that they're similar is that Rome copied Greece. Basically, Rome, the Romans thought everything the Greeks did was so cool that they just wanted to be the Greeks, right? So the actual language of administration of the Roman Empire was Greek for a long, very, very long time. So Julius Caesar would have been speaking Greek to his lieutenants or writing letters in Greek. Sometimes he wrote in Latin, but Cicero read Greek. All the educated people in Rome read Greek, studied Greek philosophers, as you will see and really thought, wow, we're gonna take the best of the Greeks and put it into action. For instance, that didn't even occur to the Romans that you could have like a national literature and all kinds of uh, works and plays and poetry that could kind of um, generate like a whole national identity. And then they captured Greece and they found all these cool books and they're like, wow, we should do that. We wanna be, so basically they, they just tried to copy everything from Greece. And because of that, um, they had a certain character that they would not have had otherwise. So we're going to jump in and talk about Horatius on the bridge. And in a way, he's self-sacrificing himself. But in a way, he's also an individual hero. He's an individualist, even though he is sacrificing himself. Some of these words, phrases jumped out at me. He prepared himself for close combat. One man against an army. So if you're one man against a whole army and you're on this bridge and the whole, this other army is trying to get across this bridge, it's a very interesting situation because apparently it wasn't a very wide bridge. So one person could stand against the whole army on this bridge, right? Because they'd have to fight you one at a time. So Horatius stood there fighting this whole army one man at a time, killed one man, killed another man, killed another man, killed another. He just kept killing individual Etruscans. And meanwhile, his Roman friends the end Roman engineers were sawing off the bridge or trying to destroy the bridge from underneath him, right? So Horatius' job was to hold this bridge until the other Romans could destroy it. And presumably he would lose his life when the bridge collapsed, everyone just presumed. So he went out in the middle of this bridge to prevent the Etruscan army from crossing it. He just fought them all one by one and they couldn't get past him. Meanwhile, their Roman engineers are sawing off the legs of the bridge or like they didn't have dynamite, so they must have been, they, I don't know what they were doing to destroy it. And meanwhile, it says that he was challenging one after another to single combat. And then with fierce cries, the Etruscans hurled their spears at the solitary figure barring their way. So that's three cases where um, the writer Livy is emphasizing the individual nature of this heroism. So that goes to one of our 10 tenets of Western civilization, namely individualism. And of course, then he plunges into the river and swims away with his sword and actually survives this whole thing, right? So just as the bridge collapses and all the Etruscans fall in the water, uh, Horatius on the bridge uh, actually survives this whole thing. That's a pretty uh, famous uh, episode from military history. Now let's talk about Hannibal, who's one of the Phoenicians. Remember last night you pointed out the Phoenicians and how clever they were resisting Alexander, right? The siege of Tyre throwing the hot sand, using the seaweed, and they actually had like a spinning wheel to deflect spears and stuff. Well, these Phoenicians who actually invented the alphabet that we use today, right? And they came from what we call today Lebanon by Israel. They had a colony in North Africa called Carthage. And this colony was really good at trading and making stuff. And obviously these are super crafty people. So they were a big rival of Rome, sort of like we're rivals with the Chinese now, and we're both like the one and number one and number two economic powers in the world. Well, the same thing, Rome and uh, Carthage were like number one and number two, and they were fighting over these trade routes in the Mediterranean, just like we fight over um, trade policies with the Chinese. So the Phoenicians, being the clever people they are, they decided under their general Hannibal, uh, in the year uh, 218 before Christ uh, to invade Italy by crossing the Alps with a bunch of elephants. 
And of course, the people in the Alps and the Romans were terrified because the last thing they expected to come out of the snowy mountains uh, where we would be skiing today would be these elephants because elephants live in the jungle, they live in Africa. The, it was totally bizarre for ele the elephants are not native to Europe, right? So they talk about how they got over the Alps um, with the elephants. And this is a very famous passage from history. But let's talk about, there's one point that I thought was interesting and I'd, I'd like to hear from you guys. But how did they, when they came to this place where they thought they couldn't go farther, how did they cut through the rock? Like they had to cut a road into rock. How did they do it? What specific kind of drink the grown-ups drink and kids don't drink? The word in the original text was frizzable, which I'd never heard, I had to look it up. But it basically moistened the rock, the, mo the, uh, the molecules in the rock, it softened it, right? So it turned it in kind of like sandstone. Um, but by heating the sour wine, right? They heated the sour wine, and then they were able to cut a road into the side of the cliff, of the rock cliff, and then they were able to get all their soldiers and all their elephants down the Alps, like a thousand feet, right? Which is pretty crazy. And these were the scenes that were from the days of the Roman Republic before it was a superpower. But once it defeated Carthage, um, when Hannibal got over the Alps, he realized it, so he had a bunch of elephants, but the people there didn't want him there. And so eventually he ran out of food and he had to run, run away and then he committed suicide. And then, then the Romans became the big power of the, of the world. And what does it mean when we say Caesar crossed the Rubicon? You're making a big decision we call uh, cross the Rubicon. So they, you know, I, I can't uh, imagine from contemporary life, but you know, let's say, I mean, when you have to, Truman had to decide whether to drop the bomb, right? And so there's no going, it's a decision where there's no going back from it. There's no undo key, so, right? So crossing the Rubicon is a metaphor that you'll come across for when, if you do something, like I say, there's no undo key, you can't, you can't go back, point of no return. So let's talk about the actual assassination of Julius Caesar as dramatized by a guy named Suetonius, who wrote the lives of these first 12 Caesars in Rome. Now, what strikes you about that passage? Like, what stands out after you read it? This is what stands out to me. Saying, oh, I want to die at this angle so that people see me this way. What does it say about someone who would do that at the moment they're being stabbed to death? Has the kind of forethought to think about their image? How they're going to be remembered? Uh, is it, it's almost like they're living, a, playing a part in a movie or a play. But here's a man who's totally conscious of his place in history already, and he's still alive. So I think, and we know that um, Caesar admired Alexander and, and was really upset that Alexander had conquered the known world by age 27. And Caesar was like 42. He's like, I haven't done anything, right, compared to that. So we know he was super into his own sense of destiny, immortal glory and fame. So my thought there is that he, he's just trying to, he's already worried about his legacy. Like, how are people going to write it, right? So he doesn't want someone to kind of write about it and say, oh, you know, like make some wisecrack that he died naked, right? So he's, he wants to make his death scene a noble ending to his life as if it were appeared in a play or he's thinking about us reading it and talking about it now. The next paragraph, the last sentence says, Three of his household slaves carried him home in a litter with one arm hanging over the side. Now, what strikes you about that? I mean, it's nothing philosophical about it. It's just an interesting detail because you can kind of picture it. So yeah. this was the big event of the ancient world. I mean, this is like the Kennedy assassination times a million because he was the leader of the whole world. He was a political leader of the, all of Europe and Africa and, you know, near Asia and Israel they controlled. So... So when that person goes down, it's a big deal. And so this is one of the most talked about episodes in history. That's why Shakespeare wrote about it. Um, but with the Kennedy assassination, it took on a life of its own. So we now know everything possible to know about the Kennedy assassination, the angle of this bullet, where it landed. It's, just, it's been analyzed and analyzed and analyzed. And Caesar's assassination, which was the first big assassination in history, 
um, it w had a similar effect. So people, it definitely, um, people scooped up every kind of detail they could. The last thing that they mentioned in this passage was who grieved for him the most of all the different peoples, the Jews. Now that also stood out for me because the Romans are occupying Israel and, but there's all these Jews who have gone from Israel to Rome, right? To do business, to work. And they're already uh, a merchant class, the banking class um, in Rome before um, and, you know, 40 years, 43 years before Jesus is even born in, in, in Israel. So, you know, that struck me as interesting, like the, the Jews had a big part of life and also they were big uh, backers of Julius Caesar. So the question in my mind is why, you know, what, um, what was Caesar's connection with the Jews? So if someone ever wanted to write a paper in history, like if you're in college or you're in graduate school and you're you want to write a paper like Julius Caesar and the Jews, you know, and then you'd start from this one quote, you'd say that the Jews said, um, especially the Jews who flocked to the forum for several nights in a row because they were so upset with Julius Caesar. You said, well, why would that be? Why, why would the Jews pick out this one emperor to be so into that they mourned him for three days? You know, I don't know the answer, but um, if any among you are historically minded, put that in your notebook, you know, maybe someday, you know, solve that mystery. Um, okay, so let's go on to talk about this idea of the Pax Romana, the period from 27 before Christ to, to 180 after Christ would become known as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Who are the two peoples, the two types, the two nations that didn't go along with the Pax Romana very well? Germans and Jews. Now that struck me as interesting because, because of the Holocaust. It very basically, it just jumped out at me. It's okay. So these two nations that were involved in the Holocaust, the Germans exterminating the Jews, both of them weren't part of the Roman Empire. Like they, the, I mean, the Jews were, but they really were not happy because the Caesars kept trying to put the pictures of themselves inside the Jewish temple, right? Up by the Torah scroll. So it just, you can imagine how... Jews wouldn't like it if they, you know, put someone put a picture of, you have to put a picture of Joe Biden in the temple. And the Jews would be like, what are you talking about? Like, he doesn't go with the Torah. But the Romans said, well, you, you know, we accept all the religions in the empire, but all the other people have to accept all the religions too. And you certainly have to worship the emperor as divine. And the Jews were like, we're not going to worship the emperor because the emperor is not divine, right? And our, our religion specifically tells us that we can't worship idols, right? We can't worship golden calves and we can't worship statues and we certainly can't worship people like Caesar, right? Because it actually says in the Old Testament not to do that. So the Jews had a big problem with that and they kept revolting. And finally, in about the year 70, the Romans came in to the Jewish temple. They destroyed it. They completely destroyed the Jewish temple and then from that point on, what happened is something called the Diaspora, where the Jews were scattered throughout the world. And um, not until Israel was created in 1948, did the Jews like get back that piece of territory and, and feel that they owned it. So let's go on to, there's, we, we read two pieces on, about Rome in the Pax Romana. One was the blessings of the Pax Romana. And then the other one was from written from the perspective of a British guy, a British soldier who was fighting the Romans. Do you have any reaction as to which one you thought made more sense or like that you sided with emotionally? Did you side with the person who in Britain who was resisting the Romans or did you, were you kind of convinced by the Greek guy with his oration regarding Rome who talked about the blessings of the Pax Romana? So you sympathize with the oppressed people. I mean, and who else felt badly for the people who were taken over? Some of the Romans. Because the guy who wrote this, I would remind you, the guy who wrote this from the British point of view was himself a Roman historian named Tacitus. And we're going to read uh, a few readings from Tacitus. So to me, that's the mark of a good writer, a good thinker, and a good historian, and a good person who can put himself in the other nation's shoes. Tacitus himself was a defender of empire and a chronicler of empire uh, around the year, like maybe 100 after, 100 after Christ. Um, but he could get his mind around what it would seem like to be conquered by Rome. So in rhetoric, we call that making the worst case seem the better. 
And if you go into debate, you will be asked to argue both sides of the question. So this is a perfect example of that. Although it's two different writers, if you were a skilled debater like Julius Caesar or Cicero, who we're talking about next, you could argue both sides of the same case extremely convincingly. So it's being like a combination between an actor and a philosopher, um, but a very deep actor who's able to kind of get inside the mind of someone who totally disagrees with you and be very convincing um, that you believe that. And a good writer will be able to write all the parts, the hero's part and the villain's part, equally convincingly. Because remember, the villain is the hero of his own story. He thinks he's right. So the, the more convincing writers will be able to do that. Now let's talk about the last reading tonight, In Defense of Arceus by Cicero. And I would just say that in the setup to that, the text says, Greece conquered, took her conqueror captive. So although Rome conquered Greece mili in a military way, Greece really conquered Rome in a cultural way. And one of the great exemplars of Roman literature, which they modeled on Greece, was Cicero. Now, Cicero is considered the most eloquent Roman. I don't know how we would describe him, but he was, Cicero was the Roman Shakespeare. He was the guy that everyone, when they th thought of Rome, thought of Cicero, and they thought of Roman eloquence. So he was a lawyer, he argued cases in court, but he also wrote a philosophy, and he had a way of turning a phrase that people have imitated ever since. And in this piece, Cicero talks about literature and its role in the humanities. And I would just remind everyone that Cicero is the guy who comes up with this word in Latin, humanitas, meaning civilization or culture. And it's about like literature and philosophy that makes us better people and better citizens. In other words, everything in this book we're reading is of that humanitas. And from Cicero's ideal of humanitas, the Renaissance people, like the time of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, the year 1500 about, um, they started calling themselves humanists, right? Because they, they didn't want to say, oh, we're Ciceronians. That, that sounded funny. So they said, Cicero's big idea was humanitas, the civilizing influence of culture and literature. So we're going to be humanists and have this humanitas. And that's why when people say, oh, I'm not really into math or science, I'm into the humanities, they get that from Cicero, this idea of humanitas um, and the humanities. Okay, so let's jump right into this piece. Basically, the idea is people who say they're not interested in literature would sure become interested if someone wrote an epic poem about their life. Like, wow, that's interesting. I love literature. Like, if it's about your life, someone's making poetry out of your life, all of a sudden you become interested, right? So I think that's a very a sly point that Cicero makes. Cicero was talking about the influence of literature on his life. And he was one of the great people of ancient Rome, probably number two to Julius Caesar. And they lived at the same time. He says, I came to believe from the reading of much literature that I should pursue above all integrity and glory. And then he says, how many portraits of brave men have Greek writers left us, not just to contemplate, but also to imitate. So he's talking about the influence of literature. And he says, I've always set these heroes before myself and train my heart and mind through the process of thinking about excellent men. So who do we mention? Solon, Odysseus, Socrates, excellent men. So the purpose of literature, which you know celebrates these excellent men, is so that people can know what is possible to humanity, moral model building. So you're not just building a model. Some people would build a model of like a spaceship or whatever. You're building models of ideal human behavior so for people to imitate, especially for young people to imitate. He says, I admit that many people have developed excellent mental qualities and courage without the study of literature, but when one adds systematic literary study to an excellent natural talent, as in the case of Alexander the Great, then something truly special arises. So what he's saying is, I, I think you understand that Alexander was obviously awesome just right out of the gate. But one of the things that helped him become super awesome was literature and philosophy. So he studied with Aristotle and then he kept Homer, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey in a special edition, which Aristotle had prepared, just like I prepared this Best of the West book. Well, Aristotle prepared a book of Homer, just selections for Alexander to read every night and, and read over and over and memorize like just the best of Homer. And so Alexander kept this under his pillow and it really kind of guided him to try and be heroic. And you noted last night the, the, the individual acts of heroism that Alexander did. 
So I would suggest that if Cicero is right, one of the things that made Alexander great was that unlike other heroes, he actually read about heroes, right? So they don't show Achilles sitting down and like studying and then like going out to fight. But Alexander did that. Alexander was inspired by these works of literature. And I think that he imitated them himself. And then let's talk about this last point I want to make tonight, which is how literature not only helps make us heroic because we imitate the acts we read about, but there's one more way in which literature, great literature, can encourage heroism. If Homer had not composed the Iliad, the same dirt that covered Achilles' coffin would also have buried his name. In other words, he never would have, uh, no one would never hear of Achilles. Going on down this page, the desire for praise draws all of us, but the best men most of all. Those philosophers who write books despising fame never seem to forget to affix their own names to them, right? So if the mind thought nothing of the future and limited all of its thoughts and aspirations to the circumscribed space of this life, it would never exhaust itself in so many labors. In other words, it wouldn't bother. To, you know, you still get out of bed, but you're like, well, what's the point of besieging Troy for nine and a half years? But if you think, oh, some great poet's going to sing about this forever, then you're like, wow, it, it, this has some meaning to it. I'm becoming godlike and immortal by being excellent. So a kind of inner voice of excellence lies within all the best men and spurs their minds with the incentive of immortality. So the last idea he leaves us with, Cicero says, you know, we make these statues and we go to all this trouble of making you know, super cool statues, concepts of our bodies. And he says, should we not far prefer to leave behind concepts of our ideas and our virtues elegantly expressed by our greatest minds? It's this idea of kind of heroic humanism. Definitely man is the center and man's excellence is the center. But the idea of heroism, which will live through history, is very much on the Roman mind. Like it was on the Greek mind, but to the Romans even more. They really wanted to be remembered. So there's different kinds of immortality, but obviously literary immortality to be sung about, to be written about, to have movies made about you 2,000 years after you're alive is a kind of immortality. It's not personal immortality. You're not personally there to live and you're not personally there to know about it, but you can go to your grave thinking, wow, I did the kind of stuff that people are gonna write about someday. And there is someone to write about this stuff because there is a literature, there are books, there are authors, there are historians, there are libraries, and what we do echoes in eternity after us, especially if it's great.